Manchester was, um, it was what they call, um, it was a cool city. Manchester was very cool. It was the Hacienda days, very much at the centre of 80s music. And it was either London or Manchester in order to escape from the Yorkshire Dales, which is where I'm from. And London was a bit daunting and Manchester was nearer to home. So I actually chose Manchester on the basis of it being quite a gay friendly city. So going to Manchester was part of my transitioning to, to if you like, to coming out and be more comfortable with myself. Manchester was very run down, um, but bear in mind that I come from the north anyway, so most of the north was pretty devastated by the early years of Thatcherism, where sort of traditional industries had just been smashed. We still had that sort of working class, sort of seething resentment about what was going on around them, and it was pretty run down, it was pretty shabby. There were no glass towers, it was pretty rough, it wasn't the safest city, you had to be careful where you went. Canal Street was um, not like it is now. When I came here, there was no cobble street. It was a road from the Union all the way up to the top. You know, the three, three dimly lit bars and prostitutes. I mean, the current building that we're in now is what Bar Pop is in. That used to be the Playboy Casino in the 70s. It was a derelict area. Going out in Canal Street in this sort of early to mid 80s was, um, it was certainly rougher and you had to be much more cautious than you do now. There was a greater element of discretion required, I would say. And at that time, the police wanted any excuse to raid your license, license establishments. Huge issue with the lesbian and gay, the lesbian and gay bars that were constantly raided. One of the first bars I owned, which was 21 years ago, uh, was constantly raided by the police because it was said that we were having sex on premises and we were selling drugs. There was a raid um, when I was there one night, yeah, we were all sort of in there having a drink and a dance or whatever. Then all the lights go on, the police come in and we all sort of stand there and they do this sort of check, what's your age, what's this, what's that. It was, it was, you didn't feel protected by the police, you felt harassed by them. It made you feel ill at ease with yourself, who you are, and also just your freedom to have a nice night out with a few drinks with your mates. You feel like an outsider when this goes on. And of course, all of a sudden, gay men were dying. One of the big dominant issues, of course, in the 1980s was, was the advent of the, of the AIDS crisis. In the early 1980s, a number of, of the, the gay community um, started developing the symptoms of HIV. And unless you've lived through it, it's very hard to describe what it made you feel like. Because we're just beginning to find our political freedoms, just beginning to, to build power through the pride marches and the networks and things that we were doing and the dropping groups and all these sort of things that were springing up in London and Manchester. And then along comes AIDS. At that time, people didn't know much about it. You know, in terms of treatment, treatment was like was very limited. Should you test or not? Because it was a death sentence, very clearly. There was no treatment. In Manchester, you had the police, the head of the police, James Anderton, who came out and said that um, gay men are dying in their own sewer, self-created sewer, and it's the wrath of God. And the, the, the sort of vindictiveness of the tabloid media, the gay plague, and all this sort of stuff that came along, which was horrible. It was a horrible thing, and, and I think it, firstly, it pulled a lot of people back into the closet. So the gay scene went under a lot of pressure. People were going out less. We were pulled back from what we'd been achieved, what we were achieving, and we then had to fight another battle, which was acceptance on HIV. That brought this community together, big style, and that helped to encompass this gay village and create a community. And what happened, like Royal Vauxhall Tavern, became a bit of a haven for people who used to come here to look after and protect each other. So you could come here and like be standing next to somebody who may very well have HIV or somebody who was not HIV. Everybody comes here, feels safe and secure within like the, these four walls. Now if you look, at, look across the park, we have the first AIDS memorial in the world. Uh, dedicated to those who lost their lives to HIV. You know, no other city's got that. This is what this place is like. It's, it's amazing in a way. Hello, darlings. It's me, Miss Lavender Mills. Welcome down to Canal Street, me and Village Angel. Yeah. <laughs> Here in Manchester, we've got all the venues, 
on and around Canal Street that were really at the front of pushing LGBT visibility and building the community that we can see today. My name is Whiplash, I've worked Canal Street for about four or five years now. Making it public and visible that some people are gay, bi and trans and have a right to and will exist and then providing the spaces where it's okay for people to be here now. I'm known as Mama Bex in Barpol um, and I kind of do a bit of everything really. I mean, I've travelled the world since the transition and this is definitely home, you know? My, my full name, my full track name, Chucky Love. 11 years this year. Oh my God. Since you come out the womb? 19 was. I have been with the bar for a while. I work at the bar because I suffer quite badly from social anxiety um, and I kind of figured that exposure therapy would be the way to, to help that. So I'm, I'm thrust into the, into the limelight and work amongst the queens every, every Saturday night and it's, it's fantastic fun. I can't tell you how it's just gone through because I just wanted it open up as a cheap tacky drag bar and it's just gone through the roof. Uh, my name is Bimini. Bimini from Boulash. Uh, my name is Sabrina Chap. My name is Frankly Desire. I've been doing drag for a year and a half. I'm a cabaret performer and songwriter. So yeah, pubs and bars all over London. I have been performing cabaret for, gosh, I think about eight years. I'm really bad at doing makeup from the house and the world. I've been performing for a long time. So the Royal Vauxhall Tavern is my favourite gay venue that I've ever been to and that's why I always come back here. And from my first Sunday, I, mean, I got hooked on it, you know, the atmosphere and the friendships that get built here. What I like about this place is it is easily the most inclusive uh, queer space I've ever been into. People come here and they've endured long-lasting friendships with people they've met here. Like, you could be lesbian, gay, trans, queer, non-conforming, you can do whatever you want and it's consistently mixed and supported. I do lip sync, comedy lip sync, normally, but not today. Today is quite political. But... On February 12th, an openly gay 15-year-old boy named Larry, who was an 8th grader in Oxnard, California, was murdered by a fellow 8th grader named Brandon. Larry was killed because he was gay. Queer spaces are really important are almost more important than ever for a few reasons. They're spaces where people can be themselves and express themselves in ways they aren't able to in their day-to-day -day lives. When I was younger, there wasn't queer representation, so you just didn't see any other gay people. So it was just so important to finally meet people that were like you, so you didn't feel so strange out in the world. It's important to have a support group or other people that understand. In Manchester, like in lots of other big cities, we have people who come here from all over, who have come here because they know it's a place where these spaces are, where they can be themselves. And that's integral, knowing when you're part of the community, that you're part of this space that will welcome people for who they are and that people will go to to be who they are.
I think although we're fortunate in 2018 that being lesbian, gay, bi or trans is much more accepted than it was even up until very recently, it's still widely the case that there's been, there are very um, particular ways in which people are expected to behave, you know, fit in with gender norms and, you know, you can be who you are within these boundaries, whereas obviously clubs, pubs and places like this are about pushing the boundaries and being who you really are with other people who are also expressing themselves. London is really expensive, really expensive with everything. Over the last let's say five years, there's been a big uh, amount of closures to our venues, which is a shame because uh, they're, they're necessary, we need them. If you look at it probably five, seven years ago, Vauxhall was a very vibrant um, gay space. What then happened over like um, the last three years or so is that all of the gay bars and the nightclubs on the embankment have closed down and moved off. And therefore Vauxhall has become like a very difficult place to try and attract the gay community into. I mean, when we had the economic climate and we had the crash, I was working for a lot of clubs around the, my club night was actually in a lot of clubs around the country. And when that crash hit, they actually closed our nights down due to financial reasons. Uh, and then shortly after that, I think that the whole scene started to change. I think, you know, the social apps were getting a hold. And do you know that little app? Have you ever heard of it called Grinder? They don't need to come to a gay bar to find another man. You can get online now and do it like you order your takeaway. It's, it's like clicking your button because technology evolves and people change. And certainly gay men didn't need to come out as much you know, for what we used to call the five to two shag. You used to go clubbing and then stand at the cloakroom at five to two to get a shag for the end of the night. They don't need to do that anymore. They've got the social apps. That has a lot to play with it. One that is very sorely missed, but there's still a activist group that are fighting, which is the Joiners Arms, which was in Dalston. The Joiners Arms was closed because um, it was bought out by luxury property developers. It's been a hub of the East End queer community and, and more than the East End, people from all over London, all over Britain and, and beyond have gone because it's been a very special LGBT class venue. It was a place of freedom, you know, its slogan was life, love and liberty and it was a place which allowed people to let loose. But it was much more than just uh, a raucous club night, you know, it was a space for, in the daytime for people to chill out, meet other people, like-minded people. And with the context of closure of LGBT plus spaces, it was a huge loss. In some ways, the situation in Manchester is similar to London. Rents are going up massively. Bars, pubs and clubs, these places have been at the forefront of cultural revolutions, can't afford to exist. Anyone who's visited Manchester at any point in sort of the last five years will have seen the huge change in the city centre in terms of flats springing up everywhere and um, the city's changing massively and there's a lot of money in these developments they're unfortunately a lot more profitable than most bars particularly lgbt bars so people who own the land can be quite keen to sell here we've got three major developments happening either end of canal street how that will impact on us i don't know at this point as more people move into flats about the area there's worries about you know are they going to expect that the village becomes quieter? Are they going to look for earlier closing hours and the venues then having changes made to their licences or being threatened with closure? Between Canal Street and the windows of where people are going to be living is not very far. If the developers don't insulate these properly, it will sound the same, you know, in some of the flats as it does in the bars and people aren't going to be happy. As with everywhere, there's been quite a few closures. There used to be two women's clubs in the village, there's now only one. When these places close down, it's particular groups of society that are affected. I suppose like any form of social cleansing that you see in these sorts of policies. The first stage was to set up the campaign to bring people who love the joiners together to say, okay, how can we set, bring back this place? Otherwise it will just be lost in London, it will turn into a ghost town. I was like, let's do something about this. Let's, let's just not let it be taken. And the conversations in the first meeting about how we can actually fight back, like it is possible. We secured um, the protection 
of the joiner's arms as a queer space in the planning process um, and we secured it back from the hands of the luxury property developers but never before had a, has there been a place which has been brought back into the hands of the community because of its importance to the queer community. People realised that we could do something about closure of queer spaces and it wasn't inevitable. The Agent of Change bill is something that people in the village are putting quite a lot of hope in as that is something that would or should hopefully be able to protect the venues in how they're operating at present. Now, developers don't have to be the enemy. In, innately, development isn't a bad thing. It's, it's, a, it's the question of development for who. The new developments that are going on around the city centre and especially around Manchester's gay village is quite exciting. It'll bring more people to the village, um, which will be good for obviously businesses and uh, raising awareness about the LGBT, LGBT community and what we are and who we are. We're also claiming to make this a heritage area, if we can, that the council will stand up and go, this is Manchester's gay village. A lot of people have fought and died for this area and for this cause. I just hope with the development, which I'm you know, looking forward to, that it doesn't lose its roots. So it's true that there are venues closing, but there's also venues opening. So I suppose London is evolving. I do think that the club scene and the gay, the gay scene sort of waxes and wanes and sort of transitions in from one thing to another thing. A lot of people are concerned it's going to change. And unfortunately, things change with time. You can't stand still. People my generation often hark back and go, it was better in my day. It wasn't, it was just different. We will never be what we were 20, 30 years ago. As a community, we have changed. Uh, but we are always there. Do we still need separate gay spaces? Yes. There needs to be a safe space for those groups to meet at times when they want to meet. Because society isn't accepting of all LGBT people, it still expects people to perform gender, perform their lives in a very particular way and to truly be themselves or feel free to express who they love and who they are, they need these venues. Literally looking at someone else and listening to them and understanding the history of our trials um, as well as being support for one another that's, that's necessary in real time and in real space and looking face to face. Everything that has been achieved in terms of LGBT rights started with the communities that were built and the revolution that was started in the bars, pubs and clubs. Equality. Equality. There's so many things that this place could be proud of. The LGBT rights movement has its base in the rights of economy and I think it's important we don't forget that when we're thinking about protecting. Community. Nightlife is important for people to make sense of themselves and the world and love and life in much more nourishing ways than being a slave to the moment. You dress up in whatever you want that you wouldn't wear the rest of the time. Getting really blind drunk and dancing tits off. I used to love that. Because dancing is great and like dancing is a form of freedom is a something which gives life. Feeling really connected and immediately in the moment with people with some great music. And I always liked being part of something that was exceptional and a bit dangerous and a bit out there. That's what I liked about it. Just that freedom living the opposite to your daytime life. sound like an old queen. <laughs>